Great. Um, yeah. Hopefully. No, are you able to record? I think I may have to record it. No, I, I, I do. I use OBS Studio, which is a capture screen capture. Okay. Thing. Okay. On the Linux here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, doing pretty well. Um, lots of stuff, lots of exciting stuff and growth happening and all of that. Um, yeah, I wanted to see, like, what we have as common ground and things like that. And also, um, uh, my question to you is, like, about team building. And, I, and so I wanted to talk about team building as well as the open source, I mean, the housing stuff. And I don't know if that's something you'd be interested in. Maybe we can collaborate more on that because, I mean, part of that is... Uh, we've been talking for some time about starting an enterprise that can viably do this in a replicable way. So we're doing Belize, and it's kind of a one-off, and we're trying to make that. If that works, then we continue doing that on a more regular basis. We're actually getting the land donated down there to OSC, so OSC would be the owner of the land, and we can continue builds there. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's it's something that when I think about it, it's like, well, we should be building at home, like in the States, right? That's That's true, too. But this opportunity came up, so definitely it's, uh, I mean, there's a willing audience there, so that happened. Yeah, but and you probably, I would assume, I would assume you have less, uh, I don't know much about Belize, but I'm assuming if it's like most Central American and Latin American countries, you have a little less issue with the kind of hoops you have to jump through here bureaucratically to do certain things in certain areas, so... Yeah, definitely, definitely. There's nothing, there's no codes there where we're going, so it's not an issue there or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. So tell me a bit about, so what, I, I saw your note about teams and, I don't know, I had some vague thoughts, but tell me a little bit more about what exactly you're curious about or what you've been struggling with, either in uh, building what you're trying to do, because it sounds like it's it's teams, but it sounds like it's beyond that. It sounds like you're trying to find a sustainable model that so that this can be a, a, a work in progress not a financial struggle in progress on a right. continual basis yeah it's definitely over the last decade we haven't paid much to uh, deliberate team building I mean it's something that was in the background but now I think I, I notice the real reason for it because the kind of work our mission is collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive inclusive economy of abundance and but we don't have a team like so Katrina and I we we live here um, cash flow yeah so it's cash flow it's about having a real organization real real teams uh, we tried it a little bit like in 2013 hired I hired four people uh, we had foundation fu funding from Shuttleworth foundations but you know that dried up so we had to let everybody go and things like that so never never built up a team and and as we go forward there's also questions like okay how do you uh, I mean that has to be within the framework of a solid organization where there's protocols and rules and all of that because we've had plenty of this of this wild wild west kind of people would descend here and you know a bunch of hippies in the woods running around uh, but that doesn't work and then you, at the end of the day you have to talk about okay where's the efficiency where's the economic product the financial feedback loops so that's that's that. And now as I go forward, why, why do I pay attention to the teams? Because actually one, one guy, uh, there's, okay, so, so for a little background on the open source work, um, my ideal was always that you can keep the organization to a minimum uh, in an open source framework, because if you're avoiding, if you're working transparently, you're avoiding all the forms of competitive waste of, of you having to bottle everything up behind closed doors. Therefore, the so it, and that's a, that's my mental model like i think okay by documenting openly building upon it you don't need to be so super tight and superhero about it like oh like uh apple gets you know the super rock stars and amazon gets the super rock stars and they create a product here it's like i'm trying to do it with more open boundaries but i think kind of running into the limits of that simply because for open hardware um one of the findings is wow that compared to open software i mean open hardware is so much harder you got physical plant operations man like all of that you're not moving electrons you're moving atoms and that's much much harder so yeah. and then what so this one guy kind of shifted my mind so this one guy um adam foyer who runs this project called uh, he did this open source eeg like brainwaves thing 
and it's an open product and he says oh yeah some company just took that and made a six million dollar business out of that and i'm like okay and then he was like no i don't want to work with you because if you're just open source like that you're gonna end up concentrating capital instead of distributing and i was like what that's the first i heard that kind of a story and this was from a guy who's actually doing software and of course he, he got burned by it because some, someone stole it but that's part of the game if you're like we're doing important stuff if someone wants to copy our business of building homes i mean that'll be great more good people doing it or if someone wants to copy our business of doing lifetime design cordless drills um let them because right now cordless drills end up in a dump after three years so we're saying okay let's take the bigger vision and uh so forth so we're not afraid about that but um the thing that from that conversation with Adam Foyer that stuck with me was like, okay, how much do you need to build a superstar team behind closed doors versus work more openly? And I still believe that pending proper infrastructure, you can work openly in a much different context where, you know, like kind of blended lifestyle where your work is your life, your life is your work. Uh, we're getting away from this corporate crime and, you know, all this big, you know, maybe some of the shortcomings of the system as we kind of repersonalize the workforce and do things that are more in tune with our uh, true vision and true needs. Because the promise of this open hardware stuff to me is we can actually free ourselves from material constraints from the idea of making a living. So once again, this post-scarcity scenario where, okay, um, abundance is there. Like technology today allows us to do that like way, way but we're not doing it so uh trying to shift to that next economy of how what what the framework would look like but right now both open software and hardware in my view are actually not succeeding well even though like software has dominated uh in the open source it's still um the models behind it are still very proprietary like even though it's open code amazon is a proprietary company or facebook or apple all of them who built their their business on on linux and open source code uh, they're all proprietary so it hasn't moved the dial for the economy and no. just to give you a framework for how we we're thinking about it next year we're actually planning to do this this cordless drill challenge to design and build a, a an open source 3d printed cordless drill that's professional grade made from waste because we're including the plastic recycling infrastructure using small machines using a small micro factory setup um, and the idea there is to build both the product and the business around it so show a first real example where that can happen by going to a platform called Hero X. It's a, an incentive challenge platform. It's a spin-off of the X Prize, And we're saying, okay, we're going to show how with a $250,000 prize, we can develop a product and actually put a dent in the $10 billion cordless drill market, market uh, industry, which is now dominated by like four companies. So it's about an historic transfer of wealth from the few to the many. That's actually... Um, my mentor told me that. Um, <laughs> do you know uh, Steve Netsley? Steve who? Netsley. Netsley? No. Okay, he's he's mentoring me on the project with the the current development of that. Um, but that's that's the kind of framework and and yeah and so I'm you know still kind of like uh been in an open source for like a decade it's not gaining traction and st still working mm -hmm. hard as ever to make that happen um and also really questioning the team aspect like okay what is the infrastructure of a team that can fit within a business model that works so uh since i've been kind of like really it's been like solo warrior this whole time uh in a way like a lot of a lot of volunteers come in and out it's there's no retention because there's no financial feedback loops and can't pay people to keep people around so trying to address that but at the same time create like for people like me who are struggling through that kind of stuff make it easier by open sourcing that infrastructure of okay now we open source physical products but also how do you open source the organization so it's easier and it's just transparent and that kind of yeah. stuff I, so i have a theory i have an idea yeah first of all i'm curious what 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 ideas have you come to about why why this part of it isn't working as well as the technical part? You know, why why the team part or the leadership part isn't um, as simple or as logical or as easy to put together as the you know 
civilization in a box idea or mm -hmm. even even the drill competition you know that could happen you don't necessarily need a huge team for that but what's your hypothesis about why it sounds like you're you're pinning it one on money like there's no money to support and maintain people i'm i'm not 100 percent sure that that's yeah that's, yeah, that's reason. <clears throat> but money is not the only th thing people dedicate themselves to but I'm wondering what else you've thought of as possible reasons why the team or the organizational aspect hasn't grown along with your ideas and your experience. I think it's because of a lack of focus on it. Yeah, we can put the money as an excuse. Yeah, we never did have constant flow of money. Uh, we're kind of always bootstrapping. But yeah, n never put the emphasis on that. It's like because developing a product, that's easy. That's hardware and stuff. It doesn't talk back to you and stuff but but for people uh, just never had the consciousness of okay here's a viable enterprise and a viable business model that can work which of course includes funding people just never spend the time on it so right now basically saying okay you know, we really need to focus on that and when we go into a project think about how do you first att really attract the team don't don't think about it okay I'm gonna do all this heroic work which is what I've always done um, and then it kind of goes, but then it hits a wall, right? Uh, I'm still I'm I'm at the wall of essentially a solopreneur. Um, that's where I am, and I'm saying no, no, no. This is I refuse to do that anymore. So it's a, it's a clear consciousness that it needs to happen. Like for example, what we're one of the initiatives right now is developing the Steam camps, um, like the open source microfactory Steam camps, where we teach people some immersion, um, immersion technical training. Um, towards open source product development so now I'm saying okay first thing is I'm really focusing on a team like getting the instructors and here's the business model by which they're getting paid and so forth so that's so I'm at this different level it's like I'm like I'm done working alone I'm gonna gather the team so I can be true to my mission which is collaborative design yeah yeah so how is that is that working the way you imagine um, no, not yet. Uh, so far, it's been uh, there was a surprise there, which was about two weeks ago. I started recruiting full time, and I thought I'd catch the people just like that uh, because we're offering to pay five to to eight thousand dollars per event. It's a nine day event, and I thought, oh yeah, no problem. People will just flock to that. I've got about four people aligned on that so far, but by and far, everything else has been pretty much no too busy or whatever and part of that the feedback I'm getting is that I'm not pitching to their interests or egos I'm like okay here's what we got I, I gotta switch that so it's a marketing thing like I'm not um, studying them in studying my candidates enough to say okay this is uh, why you it's really in your interest to do this and first I was actually going for like big names like for example the founder of the rep rep project and other big names big youtubers big people that I know from the open source community that all too busy so right now I'm going down to um, people who are more aligned in a col very collaborative aspect but they don't have to be the big stars so so and I'm finding that the collaborative minded people are actually working right now so it's a lot of it is this mindset of collaboration, uh, which is definitely super important. Because uh, so far, I have not succeeded getting any people who are so-called like the big names to, to join. It's more the collaborator crowd and building from there. Uh, so mm -hmm. that part is working, and, and we had, we do have some decent people, but it's not like what I initially thought. Where oh, we're just this is our stuff is exciting, and yeah, they'll they'll sign up. Um, you know, the TED Talk, we start with that and we're saying, okay, we're going to teach people how to do that kind of stuff. So open source product development initiatives, people have this tool set uh, for doing that. Um, engaging that using fully open source tool chains and using some of the open source digital fabrication machines like the 3D printers that we build and other machines that uh, are available. So you teach people design and build and all of that towards realistic products. That's That's the goal, that each camp builds upon last one like we might build a raspberry pi tablet on the first mm -hmm. iteration or a aerial drone and then improve it to something really what is and so marston forth. there are so here's yeah. my theory yeah here's my th it's just it's really a guess at this point but i don't know you very well yeah i mean i i met you once 
I think at a tech collaboratorium or something and then yeah. I've seen you know I've seen your work grow mostly online I've um, seen maybe a YouTube video of you I mean I've definitely seen your TED talk and stuff and I have a sense that you are technically brilliant you know not just not even just in your engineering background but you have the ability to vision something really remarkable so I think those are the areas that you shine you've made great use of your ability and you've dedicated yourself to this idea this open source idea and you're one of the you know major proponents of it in the world particularly on the product side I don't yeah. know many people doing I don't know anyone doing open source product right. um, unless, unless you consider do-it-yourself bookshelves and open source product which but you know there's plenty of plans for that on the internet but in terms of complicated machinery and electronics and 3d printers and stuff not a lot of people you probably know all of them a lot of them not not everyone yeah. but yeah so what i'm not so sure about is when you when you mention things like building a team when you mention things like leadership which are the areas that like I play in in the yeah. world they're not technical areas and right. the mistake that I've seen a lot of people make a lot of people not just technical people but leaders of all kinds of organizations you know they spend weeks and months putting together org charts right yeah and then they're surprised when it doesn't work like they got the right people in the right boxes and the thing doesn't hold together and it's partly because you're playing around with human beings who, yeah. you know, despite our best efforts, we're not logical. We're not rational a lot of the time. We don't understand our emotions. We have cultures that try and remove that from us or, or never teach us really what that means. And so we're generally not very good at the parts of building organizations that don't fit into boxes neatly or don't have easy answers you know you can answer an engineering problem that's what makes an engineering problem it's solvable you just have to be smart enough yeah. well with people smarts doesn't do much people operate on different rules yeah and if you understand the rules people operate on you've got a shot and they don't just operate I mean there are simple rules like greed and stuff I guess that's a pretty powerful rule the economy works on that but People are motivated by deeper stuff, and sometimes stuff you don't know about, and sometimes stuff they don't share with you. So, for me, when you're looking at people, the one thing you can't do is solve it in your head in advance. Like, you can't envision how it's going to be and then go put it together, because at every step, much more so than with atoms or products, you hit problems there, but then you solve them when you envision an organization or you envision a team and then you start to put it together not only do you realize that some of your imagining was a little off but then you're stuck like something hits you like oh my god not only did i never imagine that i have no idea what's like i don't have a toolkit for that because it's completely unexpected and it's not solvable in the way we solve technical problems. It's what is called an adaptive problem. And it's actually something you're also very good at. It's a trial and error problem. And it's a learn from problem. So part of it, I'm glad to say you're putting attention on stuff. But it also sounds like you, to me, there's an urgency to try and solve it before you actually have tested a bunch of different things with people and seen not only what works with people, what does attract people, you know, simple stuff. How many how many different pitches have you tried for the Steam Camp? It sounds like you have one, it, it didn't go the way you want, but what if you had three, they were completely different, and you saw which ones got the people you want attracted to. Um, part of it's just understanding human nature, and that's a big part of it, and a lot of it is listening to people. So the challenge when you have a very clear vision is you're trying to create that mm -hmm. and everyone sees the world differently than you do so it's it's a paradox when you have a big vision because to the degree that you have to listen to other people's visions 
or their desires, it almost feels like you're wasting time because it's not moving you closer to your vision. So it's like, next, next. But there's a lot of information in those reactions to your vision. And listening really well, as opposed to just pushing for your vision, can give you some of the clues about what might be missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um yeah, so let's let's take a look at like one one topic. Like, okay, what I pitch pe to people is okay. We we have a um, we're trying to develop a way that open source product development can become a, a viable force. In fact, my mission is to to uh, transition the current economic paradigm from proprietary to collaborative. Now, and Steve said an historic transfer of wealth from the few to the many so perhaps an important problem something that we've solved production in society we have not so solved distribution um, so okay let's say we have a big vision like that and some concrete steps to get there like steam camps as a as a significant funding model because i think that can scale uh, and then the incentive challenge and part of the resources from the steam camps would go to the incentive challenges which after we do the first one we run them on, on a regular basis. And to date, I think that's probably the, like if you talk about crowd, mass crowd development, I think the incentive challenge format has proven itself to be the most robust in terms of producing results. Like basically, you put up a certain amount of money as an incentive, and people mm -hmm. will end up each spending like 10 times that amount to f fight for the prize. But we're designing it to be absolutely collaborative, so I think there's a lot of potential there. Okay, so say we can develop products in a replicable way so that we put that everything that society makes is open companies like um, General Electric or or whoever Boeing they go to just like with Linux they go to the common pool of design as opposed to starting from scratch that's the kind of model we envision and livelihoods being there so and I think the feedback has been that, yes, uh, the idea of livelihood from open collaboration, I've seen that resonate with a number of people. Um, that's good. So if that's the case, um, I guess what am I trying to ask here? If there's this big vision that a lot of people subscribe to, um, and I think, I mean, some some feedback, I mean, I did have some feedback that says, yes, this is definitely worthwhile, but no one can get in. It's super hard for anybody to get involved because you you know at the end of the day you got to make a living, right? Which we haven't solved. But let's say there's this vision. So so is that like my question keeps being like okay how do we can we actually gather a team around that or um, in a massive way in a tr you know movement transformative way or is it no that's not how it works you know like I don't know. I'm, I'm trying that right now, which is to attract people to this um, while showing that the economics work. But uh, do you have any comments on, like, how feasible is that? Is that how things work? Like, can you actually attract a good number of people to something? Uh, if, like, they say, yes, it's great, I'd love to do it, but nobody can because of the financial feedback loops. But now that we are putting in the financial feedback loops, which I think is what's happening, uh, that's that's like our next major stage. Okay, teams, revenue, like you know, real organization that can actually sustain people. Um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know that I haven't answered your question. I mean, I can think of examples that already exist of maybe not the degree. I think what I'm not clear about, what I haven't heard from you, you might or might not yet be clear on, is so. Why, like, why are you doing this? Here's here's what I here's yeah. what I'm seeing. Mm. You are, you know, a, a scrappy visionary entrepreneur, out against the the big bad private capitalist system. You know, and you know when you look at it that way, and I think to some degree it is that way. And most people earn their livelihood through that system, whether they like it or not. And people respond to security and fear. So yeah. even though people may want something, uh, change is something that very few people willingly dive into. Some people do, but most right. people are like, you know, sounds good, but you know, let me see, you know, show it to me before. And some things you have to just participate in. So, what is the, what are you trying? 
to solve for really are you trying to I mean are you working towards a world where commerce is radically changed and we are self-sufficient are you working towards is that the main thing is it to radically change the financial system is it to provide safety and security and and basic necessities for people the radical transfer of wealth for me honestly and I I'm you know basically a social worker um, in my heart is scary in the sense that what I know what existing wealth will do is fight tooth and nail to kill anyone who's going to try and take it away yeah. so that as a direct kind of message I think you've just written off three quarters of the planet who are either wealthy themselves are protective of the people who are wealthy themselves or whatever and it sets up this almost like yeah it's a Robin Hood thing it's you know we're gonna be Robin Hood and Robin Hood was great but Robin Hood was a criminal most of his life and never totally changed the system and so you keep getting like well do we want to be outlaws and the system I don't know there's almost a Buddhist perspective to all of this which looks at things and says okay if things are not good or bad and we just look at the system as it is and assume that there is some reason this system developed. It's not the logical, the back to, it's not a technical thing. It's, I think part of the reason we're in the world we're in is human nature has led us here. Mm -hmm. Or at least human nature combined with social training has led us here. And if you don't understand all that, you can't unlead us here. Like, People can see that things are bad, but they don't know how they participated in that. They don't know why they chose to make some of those choices, but they did. Like, I don't think there are bad people, but there are a lot of bad things happening in the world. And people are motivated to do bad things because they're trying to take care of themselves in some way. You've identified a need that people need to eat and make money in order to give their time and energy to something. I believe that that's true. If you're looking to create a collaborative world, there are collaborative examples. I mean, there are cooperative ventures in the world, not widely known, and they're not the majority. There are business cooperatives that are owned by workers. How well do they run? It varies. Um, there are... Like Mondragon. They're all, by the way, like, uh, my, my critique, just to insert that, it's they're still proprietary consortia. They don't collaborate with outside watch. I'm, I'm talking about a step beyond that, yeah. Well, in a way... Your the idea of open everything, I think in a way, it, and I'm not saying this in a judgmental way, but it's a, 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 for some reason I'm thinking of human development. As infants, we come into the world not even knowing we're separate from anything. Mm -hmm. Like everything that happens is me. It's just, I am the world, the world is me. I, I was connected to this other person, and now I'm somehow not connected, but I still feel like I'm connected. Everything that happens is me. Somehow I control the light and dark, mm -hmm. and there's no separation. And then we learn that we're separate. So in a sense, we're taught that we're separate. We're given language that says me and mine. You know, where does that come from? Some cultures didn't have as much of that, supposedly. You know, the earth wasn't ownable. That was a concept, a very interesting concept. But uh, nation states are, you know, all that stuff. It's, it's a concept. But we live under those concepts, and people believe it to hold truth, even though it holds none of that. Finance is the same way. It's all conceptual. Yeah. It's a yeah. set of beliefs that allow us to cooperate together. Um, has unintended consequences too. You're looking for an alternative way for people to cooperate. Are you still asking me what my fundamental motivation is? I'm curious about it because I think that is what is going to it's, either attract people or repel people. Yes. It's so simple. It's just freedom. The freedom to do Daniel's Pink or Daniel Pink's or rather Desi, uh, that's the original guy. That's the self-determination theory. We can pursue the things that are most meaningful and important to us as opposed to worrying about making a living. So to me, it's absolute freedom. I've seen that coming from Poland. 
I was in a slave state behind the Iron Curtain. Came to America and was like, wow, well, what a difference. And um, my life has been pretty easy. Didn't have any problems, uh, really. So I'm trying to say, okay, let's create that opportunity for everybody on a planet. Because we cannot leave people behind and all that. That's, that's the fun, fundamental motivation. So that's that. Now, underneath that, freedom is uh, the biggest observation from my history in Poland is material security is a big big one. Uh, resource conflicts still are a dominant paradigm in society that kind of drive our politics and lives and breakups between couples and all that. So we need to eliminate that uh, so that we have a chance to evolve to as humans. That's that's the um, right now we don't even have a chance yeah. to evolve as so, a society. So basic, deep freedom, self determination to do what you know brings you joy in life or fulfills some deep passion. Yeah. As a result of having material security, having basically yeah. a home and and water and and your basic needs met. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So there are lots of people who are already in different ways aligned with that kind of idea. Mm -hmm. Your mm -hmm. tool to get there is, you believe, is open source and sharing of information, and yeah creativity and knowledge and, and product in particular. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you're up against a system that does everything it can to protect product yeah. and keep it private. Yep. Except we're in a time when, you know, there are common, um, there are licenses that allow a certain amount of sharing that are not totally proprietary. Yeah, yep. Okay, all right, so I got the deeper cause. And I like your deeper cause. It's to me, it's encapsulated in Star Trek for me. It's that, it's that period in human history when people do what they love and they're supported to do it and everyone has enough to eat and nobody's, you know, obscenely well, wealth is not a sign of status. It's more competence and kind of what you do versus... Mm -hmm what you were given by four generations of ancestors. Yes. It's about creating the ethical economy where, to me, it's like, it's pretty simple. Like, uh, and in sociology or s psychology, you must have heard of this experiment where in one setting, people were competitive and in another setting, they were helping each other, which says that it's the infrastructures in the world that determine how we behave. Right now, we have an infrastructure in the world that determines that we are killing each other. We need to change that infrastructure to a different system. So that's the kind of... I don't want to piss off everybody saying like, oh, this historic transfer of wealth. No, that, I don't want to be careful about that. It's, it's about something that in a business world comes up as a winner. People simply opt in for, okay, collaboration gets us better results. We'll go with it kind of deal. So, yeah, being careful not to piss off anybody. <laughs> um, so back to back to your initial question, yeah. which is how do you engage people in this endeavor in a way that actually helps you with energy and labor and participation rather than cost you because of just it's so much time just getting and managing people you don't actually have time to do the work. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's about building a team, having a skill set to get people who are aligned, who are frictionless and all that, like, and stru so both structure and very subtle things that you can't, that the soft skills that enable one to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you leave out that last, you're never going to get a team together that's frictionless. I don't even know if you want that. It's not going to happen with human beings. Okay. Okay. And the best teams are not frictionless. They're teams actually ah. that rub each other the wrong way a lot, but they know how to manage that. Ah. And they use that as a as a strength. Okay, yeah. And they know how um, to manage it, yep. Otherwise, you just get a clone of yourself and you leave out most of the world. Because most of the world, you know, we each have our way of seeing the world, and most of the world doesn't see things exactly the way we do, ever. A few people do. Yeah. But those not that's not a team, that's just clones. That's like no, don't they'll want that. replicate your mistakes as well. Yeah. Because they agree yeah. with you. We won't see blind spots. You need you need conflict and arguing and time between people to really have an ethical economy for everybody. 
Because there are people who want and need things that you don't even value. And they do. So anyway. Um, so how, how do you imagine I might be helpful in this? We can start a business doing <laughs> doing open source housing in America. No, I wanted to ask you about about if I would I would start a business doing open source housing in America. I see a lot of I see a lot of potential challenges to that. But I, I wanted uh, to touch with you on what are, what are your interests in that? Because uh, if we're going all the way down to Belize to experience that, uh, there's common interest. So you're interested. In the natural housing and stuff like that but have you given any thought to um, that at the enterprise level or I mean one thing I would ask is yeah I mean I want to get a team going with that project and it's definitely an uh, agenda for open source ecology and I do see myself doing that so I was wondering if there's any interest you have in that or what your interests are in that well I'm clearly in the exploring stage at this point. I mean, my initial interests are selfish um, around wanting to, uh, you know, potentially build a place that I would feel material secure in for the remainder of my life. Where do you live, um, by the way? You're in. I'm in South Philadelphia. I live in a, a, oh. a row house in South Philly, mm -hmm. um, and I've been here for 13 years. And uh, relative to most of the population, I'm. I'm materially secure, mm -hmm. but security is both, uh, I think most security is imagined. There's a reality to it. I think I'm past the reality to it. Most of what remains for me is, a, you know, ephemeral fear, which I think a lot of people have in our current economy that no matter what you do, you'll never have enough. You, kind of you'll idea. never what? No matter what you you'll do? You'll never have enough. Oh, you'll never have enough? You know, Something will happen. You'll lose whatever you say. So you know, it's we have we have a system that doesn't really provide security. Um, anyway, um, and at the same time, I'm also aware that homes are expensive. I mean, I can afford my house, but my girlfriend couldn't, and she had to sell her home. And I convinced her to sell her home, but she was convinced that owning a house was a good thing in our world. And I was like, no, that's the marketing, and you'll be broke forever. So, and I realized more than half the population is in, in this country, a very wealthy, relatively wealthy country, is in that situation. They mm -hmm. don't own homes. Yeah. They can't own homes. Yeah. And I don't know if that's because just generically homes need to be that expensive, or if that's part of, you know, the way the industry built itself it got created so I am interested in that and I want more people to have homes I think homes create communities ownership is very different than renting for a lot of people um, it just creates a different social fabric yeah and I'm interested in that um, I also think a lot of people are deceived a lot of people think they own their homes when all they have is a giant loan and an endless amount of taxes and payments for the rest of their life and they don't really get that yeah, you know, um, they're not paying rent, so they think they own something. And the reality is, they don't until they pay off their mortgage and they find a way to guarantee that they'll have enough money to pay taxes for the rest of their life. So, you know, there's a lot of deception in our current economic system that people don't realize unless you're financially sad. Um, so there's all that. But my main goal in coming is to see what's possible self-build what's feasible, learn a bit about materials and look for, I just finished a, a straw bale workshop. There's a woman here a couple hours away in Pennsylvania mm. who um, is an architect and a um, natural building. She really is a master of clay plasters. So, and she's built and designed probably a few dozen um, straw bale homes in the Northeast and She's a lovely woman, and all, you know, anyway, she's very wise. And um, so we took a course with her, I really liked her. If I ever built anything personally, I'd probably hire her to help if I didn't know how to do it myself. But mm -hmm. I'd love to get the place where I do know how to do it myself. And I have a good sense of what materials make sense in different climates and 
what works and what doesn't and what are the advantages and disadvantages. So part of my going in the build is just to experience it and see, oh, what's really involved in making bricks and what is the home, how is the construction process and what seems to me, just in my naivety, what seems like, yeah, I'd like to live in that and no, I wouldn't like that and mm -hmm. so what is that going to look like? What are the costs? What's the involvement? I'm also extremely interested in, and I don't even know if you've perfected this, but mm -hmm. it seems like you have a way of bringing a whole lot of people together to do a project when only a few of them really have skills. And that seems like a potential model for uh, doing something like home construction without having everyone be whether you say they're knowledgeable or not, be, be you know, a, a craft carpenter or, or a licensed contractor per se. So how do you use labor and involve people in that to reduce tangible costs? Yeah. Hard costs. Um, so I'm interested in all that. Long term, look, I, there are a number of companies now, you probably know about this one, I'm forgetting the name right now, there's a company in Austin, Texas who's 3D printing houses. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a bunch of them doing that, yeah. They just they have some project actually in South America where building they're building two hundred low income houses somewhere, Ecuador, Guatemala, somewhere. Um, and that's fascinating to me, you know, that you could you could three D print cement, you know, an eight hundred square foot house in twenty four hours, insulated, put a roof on and, you know, for a extremely low cost. Um, now I know the building industry is not just going to roll over and play dead. There's a lot of money involved in construction and real estate and all of that. But it seems like an area where if enough people got involved, you can do your own thing. Even building codes, as long as you meet standards and you can prove sure. things, there are no restrictions there. Um, so I'm interested in all that. So I have a personal interest, I have a collective interest. I'm not sure I'm ready to give up my current... I love what I do as a coach. It's been personally and professionally rewarding. Uh, it's, been a good, it's been a good gig for a long time, and I'm really good at it. Um, so I found a way to play the game in our current economy, even though I have a pretty deep understanding of its flaws. Mm -hmm. I realize it is a game. And... Uh, you don't have to be a genius to learn the rules and play some of it. It is a little soul killing if you don't if you don't see it as a game and you take it too seriously. Mm. Um, but I also think most people have good hearts, and if you can find a message that appeals to that, you'll get a lot of support. A lot of support because everyone I meet wants very similar things at their core. They yeah. just have very different ways about going about getting it. Yeah. And, uh, that's that's the challenge, you know. How do you get enough people aligned around the approach you're going to take to meeting needs? Um, I have a question for you, which is: um, It sounds like you you did a couple of, or you tried a couple of projects where you are out in the, out in the boondocks of Missouri or wherever you are. The deep um, Missouri underground. Mm -hmm. Yes. And. Um, how, how, I assume you had a plan for that to kind of grow and become something, and did you hit some hitches in that? Well, uh... Or what were the hitches that you hit? Well, the, the last, the hitch from the last decade was that I forgot one important ingredient, and that is that we need to have a product. <laughs> That's a common problem of the open source world, so we've been prototyping a lot and never paid attention to the business, so we've not scaled. But we have done hundreds of prototypes. We know how to build a house, a 1,400 square foot house in five days with 50 people. We know how to build 3D printers, tractors, you name it. Um, we've got a lot of experience wait, wait, and now it's time those to... those are all products. Those are all products. When you well, say you don't have a product, what do you mean? A di distinction between project or prototype and productized, commercialized thing. That's, that's the distinction I'm referring to. We have several things that are the house. Um, tractor, brick press, 3D printer, all that you can make a significant business out of. And so right now I'm basically decided to take the 3D printer and make that as a first significant business. Uh, so that working on that. But the block, um, yeah, just, um, I don't know if it's, it's, 
probably the long-term vision of because because what I still need to do like I, I am committed to the global village construction set all the tools because once you have that the synergy and just the the cost reduction and all that is just builds exponentially um, once you have more pieces and the ability to make more of them like for example solar concrete you know we got gravel underneath our our place here we take out our tractors use solar panels in our material production facility like I talked about in the uh, uh, Open Building Institute and we do crazy things like making our own block make even making the cement doing our like doing a lot of stuff from rock sunlight plants soil water uh, so I've been really evolving that and uh, every single day it's like wow this is so feasible and crazy that's why I'm I'm going um, through this questioning of okay given that that is and, and it's not feasibility or anything um, why can't I get people on board in a more significant way? Well, it's because you have to understand all of that first. You have to be uh, understand first principles, and you have to be numerate and all that. So, but we're very enumerate, and we do not understand basic principles of the physical world. So, when I tell for say to people that the sun gives us ten thousand more power than we use today, it doesn't mean much to a person. To me, it means that a lot of things, like, for example, that we can handle a hundred times more population without any problems, uh, which is a crazy thing, or that we can make the world 10,000 times better or 10,000 times worse. It's like we have all the options. We have the material, uh, we have energy security, therefore material security. But you have to really think about that to, to get so excited, like, wow, we can change the entire civilization here. Uh, so uh, it's clearly not, people not understanding. But then again, so I need to be the entrepreneur. It's about marketing of a product that doesn't exist. So it's a tough one. But um, There's also and there are products that do exist that we can do. Yep. Yeah. But again, I think the piece, the missing piece in the equation, is what is the human journey along that change? Tell me more about that. So you have a picture in your head of a future that to you is not only possible, it probably lives live in your head. Oh, yeah. Like, you already see... I'm already there. Exactly. And you're there largely alone. Very. <laughs> That's important. That's important to be aware of. Yeah. Um, so you're there alone, which, m number one, means... It's an exciting and terribly lonely place. Mm -hmm. And if you understand change, the psychology of change, for someone who's not there, mm -hmm. it's a process. It's not, you're not going to get, see, I think you're like, well, if I solve X or Y, I'll get people there. No. People are going to plod along. They're going to resist even things that are good for them because people tend to do that. Psychology, people are attacked. They don't want to lose things even if the gain is significant. Like we always want more. We just mm. don't want to give up anything we have. And the world you're living in in your mind and see for us requires that people actually let go of quite a bit of social and cultural bullshit that they've gotten attached to. What you're not realizing is the vast majority of people in this country, their identity and their status is all built on what they can afford to buy. Your world, that's not even a question. So, unfortunately, you're like, you know, Hopefully, not too, hopefully, hopefully you're here and the destruction of the planet's here, but it may be the reverse. Like, you know, we might destroy the planet before we get to the world you see. I hope not. But I think you're not... We're not. You're not patient enough for the psychological journey it's going to be for the rest mm. of humanity. How long does it take? Mm. I have no idea. But longer than you think... And because of that, what, what I'm guessing might be a turnoff to some people, and I don't know, or resistance is, they're not, and I'm using smart, not in this just intellectual capacity way, but close, they're not as smart as you, and they're not going to get there. And 
you're going to get impatient. And some of that impatience is going to be reflected and people are going to oh, respond to it. Not super impatient. I mean, I, I just picked up uh, Munger's, the, he does, Char, whatever Charlie Munger talks oh, about, talk cognitive about bias, right? So I'm, I'm yeah. getting really clear about cognitive bias and seeing that in myself and all that. So I'm trying to also question, like part of this question is questioning like the other side much more. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not. Sure. I know. I know it can take forever, but it, but I think it's my duty to be the entrepreneur, uh, to to sell sell my product. But here's the thing. You're you're. For example, I've I've looked at your stuff on 3D printers, and I've thought of coming thought of coming to one of your 3D builds, and just so instead I'll go to Belize and go halfway around the mirror just to play with with you with mud with you. Mm, um, right. But the 3D printer. The offerings that you're doing, they're very attractive to a certain select group of people. Mm -hmm. They could be attractive to a much larger group of people. How? But the marketing would have to be very different. Well, no one, no one really gives a fuck unless you're a techie about a 3D printer. What they do give care about is all the things a 3D printer could make if they had one. And that's nowhere in your stuff. You know, it's all focused on the, the technology of the equipment, which is mm -hmm. fascinating to some people. And for the vast majority of people, they really don't care what a 3D printer does or how it works, which is another question, but they just want the output of it. When you say, you know, with, yeah. with these five things, you could make 80% of what's on Amazon, even that, it's not a good statement for most people because it's... That's very different. Then they have to imagine, they have to really think about it versus saying, hey, you know these five things that you just spent $3,000 on over the past year? With a $1,000 3D printer, you could have made those for yourself and a hundred times more. You know, so it's finding what's meaningful to individuals and then saying, we can help you get that versus coming from the tech side. Yeah which is what you're really good at, and it's probably very exciting to anyone who's technically minded or engineering already kind of in the fold. It's like, yeah, let's do that. That's not most of the population. Most of the population gets into yeah. a car, and they all they care about is you turn the key in, it takes you where you want to go, and it looks cool. That's it. So this whole idea of being able to build your own car, maintain your own car, whatever, it's a radical shift in ownership and responsibility, which is really what you're talking about. I mean, Amazon lets us to totally ignore how anything is made, where it's made, what it's made of, and just buy it because we want it. Yeah. And my sense is you're much more aligned with, you know, circular economy and all of that work. And I think there are growing movements of people getting there. but. For the people who are going to give up a lot or think they're going to lose a lot, we have to start educating them about what they're going to gain instead. And we're not very good at that, I don't think, in a deep way. Uh, um, we're not good at what? Helping people really feel the benefits of what a world would be like where they were materially secure and where they were really free to do what they wanted. Every, every single person. I work with in my life, that's what they want. That's why they work. And it's kind of a, you know, it's a shell game. Uh, very few people get it. So you're saying that a lot of people around you just say that, but they don't mean it? No, they mean it. But there's not a credible alternative. So how And do you I don't know hmm. most people that you're a credible alternative. You know, when No, they, I'm not. Not yet. They, they, not yet. That's a great idea, but show me, and you can't show them yet. You know, you no, can show them yet. your house. But so that's, I think there's just a bit of patience that you're going to have to, you're going to have to have some stuff to show. You yes, can talk yes. a good game for only so long. So it's figuring out how to make that happen. And it may, it may be a very long plan, you know. Even your Steam project, which sounds great, I think it's not something that's going to happen in two years. Thousands of people aren't going to go through it in two years because the first half a dozen times you run that, 
you're going to learn, things are going to mess, you know, it's like you're prototyping yeah. even that. But in my mind, that's a product. Yeah. In my world, teaching people stuff is a product. You can sell that. You can sell knowledge. It, you don't have to do a drill. You can teach people 3D printing. Not just how to make the 3D printer, but what's the biggest impediment to 3D printing? I have NextFab here in Philadelphia. It's a great, you know, monthly fee workshop. They got all kinds of equipment there. And I went and took all kinds of courses. And you know what stopped me from using stuff more? I don't have I don't have a background in CAD design or I don't want to spend the time. I didn't have the time to learn the software that controls the machinery. It's not that I didn't understand it or don't have the capability to do it. I just don't have the time. And I don't want to sit down and learn a bunch of open source software or, you know, have to buy whatever they were using, Adobe, who knows, whatever. So I think there are lots of things that for you You've already put in the sweat equity and you're past, you're past a lot of the curves that other people, you know, you're on the top of the hill going, come on. And people are looking up going, whoa, that's a big hill. And you're like, it's great up here. It's great. Come on, join me. And they're like, shit, there's ice. There's fucking, I'm going to fall off. You know, no, I'll just stay down here in the swamp. Yeah, but we can teach them to do free CAD in about one hour for the basic workflow, Ken. I'll teach you that. But that... But that is what people need, and yeah. people need to go through it, and people need to tell other people yeah. that that's true. So I think I actually believe that I don't know, look, all of what you're doing, and I'm sure I'll learn more when we're together in February. Oh, and by the way, I have to, I have to jump onto a call in a minute. But yeah. um, I believe that your most viable offering is teaching and teaching what you know and finding what parts of what you know seem valuable to other people. Taking your STEAM program, what if you don't run it yourself? What if you take it to a university and say, we'll run this for you, give us your name, enroll students, capture tuition, we want this percentage. I'll bring you the teachers, they do the facility. You know, but there are different ways to partner in the existing infrastructure. What you bring is a wealth of experience in, in an area that I think a lot of people are interested in exploring and they really don't know how. Yeah. Well, Ken, the and good news is, yeah, we are developing this Steam Camp as that's like our main product development right now, yeah. But if you want to really do it in a collaborative way, you may not even need to do it where you own or do the whole thing. You may be able to partner people who make it really easy for you. They may even bring you instructors for all you know. So anyway, there's... <laughs> There are unintended side effects to all decisions. Like, there's a way that the open source community, as incredible and interesting as it is, almost exists in the shadow of our current economy in some way. And people don't even know about things like, you know, open source software. They do. They know conceptually. But for most people, it doesn't, unless they're involved in it, they're a coder, or they use it and are involved in the licensing, they don't even know it exists, really. It's a small group of people who have a sense of what it even means. And philosophically, it may be important, but I think it's more important that you just demonstrate something viable. And I would do it as small as possible to make it easy to succeed. Your plans are big, they're grandiose, they're wonderful, but they're complicated Yeah, in many ways. They're complicated. And um, that means you have lots of places where you can kind of go off track or have unexpected costs or issues. Um, anyway, happy to talk more at some point, but okay. I got to call a client and pay my mortgage. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to know if you think yeah, we can partner. Like, what are your ideas on that? Yeah, I mean, that's what we're trying to do, just, just stop working alone. Yeah. <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> How do we do it? How do we make it easy? Yeah. Got to be able to put up with people. Okay. All right, Ken. All right. I will think if you come up with anything, let me know. I'll do the same. I'll reach out. 
and otherwise I'll see you in, in a few months. Either yeah. Way. Okay. But, um, hopefully we'll be in touch before. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. You all. Bye-bye.